I'm delighted to get this opportunity to represent um, the uh, ORNA crew here at UCSC. And um, I'm super excited to tell you about this particular project, um, which is actually uh, on splicing. Um, mostly, uh, most of my lab is working on long non collagen RNAs, but this project is a collaboration between myself and Dr. Angela Brooks's lab. And Angela is another member of uh, the RNA Center at UCSC. And this, the, all the work that I'm going to present to you today has been uh, driven by these two students, Electra, who's my graduate student, and actually she'll be finishing up in about six months. So if anybody is looking for a spectacular postdoc, uh, please feel free to reach out to Electra. And um, Pratiba is also um, a joint partner in this project, and Pratiba is now carrying out her uh, graduate work in Jean Yeo's lab at UC San Diego. Okay, so I am an immunologist and my research interest really is understanding how we recognize the world of microbes and danger signals. And um, we are really focused primarily on the innate immune system. And my lab mostly works on these cells called macrophages, which are the sentinel cells that go around your body and kind of alert to the presence of danger. And um, just showing you here that danger comes in many forms. One is with the recognition of um, pathogens. And what these cells are specialized in doing is recognizing specific components on these pathogens. And so we have receptors on the cell surface as well as within cells that can recognize these components and turn on inflammation to drive um, these complex complex signaling cascades that result in the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines as well as interferons. And these play critical roles then in the downstream activation of our adaptive immune system, which is what provides you with memory. And the reason we're really obsessed with this pathway is because this represents the um, inducible inflammatory response. And so we know that inflammation is critical to keep us healthy. Um, but if these pathways are not really tightly controlled, it can lead to chronic inflammation. And so we know that chronic inflammation is a central feature of essentially every condition you can think of, whether it's cardiovascular disease, neurological disorders, cancer, chronic inflammatory disorders, et cetera. And so really trying to get a better handle on the molecular mechanisms that drive chronic inflammation is gonna be critical if we wanna um, really go after new therapeutic targets uh, for inflammation that could then have a huge impact on a whole variety of different diseases. And so in the context of this talk, what we're really interested in going after is the role that splicing is playing during inflammation. So I know this audience doesn't need an introduction to what splicing is, uh, but essentially we know that splicing um, really allows for this huge increase in the repertoire of proteins that are produced out of a cell. And what we're simply asking is, is there a difference in these splicing patterns that occur if we compare unstimulated cells to cells that have undergone an inflammatory activation? And here we're focusing on specifically what's happening in macrophages. And so to do this, what we are going after is uh, we started off by doing some uh, nanopore sequencing. So we wanted to take advantage of the long read technology because it allows you then to see complete isoforms that are being made in cells. And to do this, we uh, performed direct RNA sequencing on bone marrow derived macrophages taken from mice. And so we have control cells or cells that have been activated to turn on inflammation. In this case, we're using LPS, which is a component of gram negative bacteria. It drives inflammation through activation of toll-like receptor four. Then we performed our direct RNA sequencing, performed a differential splicing analysis and looked at our significant hits. And here I'm just showing you all the different splicing events that we identified that are changed after you turn on inflammation in macrophages. And so obviously we were very interested in focusing in on this particular class of event, which is alternative first exon usage, because this is the dominant splicing event that we identified following uh, inflammatory activation in macrophages. So we also did this sequencing on Illumina so we could compare um, what we see by using short read technology or by using the long read technology. And what we were excited to see is that indeed we see the same thing, that the dominant um, event that we're recording after inflammatory activation is this alternative first exon usage. And in fact, we see more um, events if we use the nanopore compared to um, the short read data. And so we do see quite an overlap between the two technologies, but there is a number that we were able to identify by nanopore that were essentially um, 
on annotated isoforms using this technology. Also, we're very interested in being able to determine if this particular event that we're seeing in mouse macrophages is conserved across species. So we were able to perform the same experiments on primary human macrophages that have been um, activated with LPS and compare them directly to our mice. And again, we see that indeed this alternative first exon event is the dominant event in both human and mouse following inflammatory activation. And another really interesting feature that I wanted to point out from this data is that we were um, pretty surprised and intrigued by this, that the fact that the majority of the alternatively spliced genes that we identified are not actually differentially expressed following inflammation. So what we mean is that the dominant uh, splicing events are um, occurring um, and it's, it's not necessarily an increase in transcription of those particular genes. And this is particularly interesting for immunologists because often we really go after things that are, you know, highly turned on or turned off after inflammation. But this just shows you that the isoforms are switching. So there's a dominant switch in the isoform usage after inflammation, not necessarily always accompanied by an increase in um, expression of that particular gene. But the one that I'm going to focus in on for the rest of my talk today is an example of a um, protein where we do see a dominant new isoform arising after inflammation. And so this is the protein AIM2, which is absent in melanoma 2. And just what I'm showing you here is what we see from our data, which is that this is the basal isoform of AIM2 that's expressed. Um, it's a canonical, canonically expressed protein. So it's expressed in control and after LPS. But this new isoform that we've identified up here, which is using this um, alternative start site and an extended 5' meteor, what this gene is, is dominantly turned on after LPS. And so the reason we were super excited about this is that AIM2 is an incredibly well-known protein in the innate immune field. And AIM2 itself is highly induced following inflammatory activation downstream of the LPS signaling cascade. It is an interferon-inducible gene. And what AIM2 does is in the cytoplasm, its role is to act as a sensor for double-stranded DNA, where it forms this um, complex known as the inflammasome. And the inflammasome results in activation of caspase 1 that can cleave uh, and release pro-IL-1 into IL-1 beta that gets released out of cells. So this is a well, really well studied pathway. And so we're really intrigued to find that we've identified this new isoform that has never been seen before of this particular well-studied protein. And this is just showing you a breakdown of what we see from our direct RNA sequencing. So this is the annotated transcript that we've known for AIM2, and it is the dominant transcript that we see from the reads at control levels. But after inflammatory activation, um, we can see a number of new isoforms uh, being produced. And what all of these isoforms have in common is this new upstream exon. And the major uh, isoform being produced is number five. So you can see that the majority of the reads go to this following LPS stimulation. And so we wanted to confirm that this is indeed what we're seeing by confirming just by using qPCR. So we designed primers to the annotated region. So this is within the five prime UTR. And what we see is that, um, in fact, there's not a lot of inflammatory activation at this region. If we then design primers to this new un unannotated region upstream, as well as um, flanking a common exon, we now see that this is um, the inflammatory inducible uh, isoform. So we see it dominantly induced following six hours of LPS stimulation. And if we use our primers that we would use to the coding exons, um, uh, as expected, we see that AIM2 is highly induced following six hours of LPS stimulation. So just what this has shown us that while we've known for years that AIM2 is a highly inducible gene, what we now know is that it is in fact this isoform that is the inducible form that's being produced in these cells. So we know that what, um, what's happening is that there's a use of an upstream promoter. And so we just compare the transcription factor motifs between the annotated promoter and this new upstream unannotated promoter. And we were interested to see that the majority of the transcription factors driving this are inflammatory associated um, transcription factors like the IRFs as well as NF-kappa B, um, P65 component of NF-kappa B. And so we took a look at data from the SMAIL lab where they did chip seek in macrophages for this component of NF-kappa B, P65. So this is in bone marrow derived macrophages after inflammatory activation. They use KLA, which also activates TLR4. And if we look here, 
This is data from the UCSC Genome Browser. So this is the canonical AIM2, and this is our new upstream, our alternative unannotated transcription start site. And we see that the mo there's a lot more P65 binding to this upstream region following inflammatory activation at the six hour time point dominantly. And so we believe this is helping to drive this new isoform of AIM2. And so this new isoform of AIM2, what it essentially provides us with is a longer five prime UTR. And so this really made us think, why would we have this longer five prime UTR and what might it mean mechanistically for control of AIM2 and control of the innate immune response? So we know that uh, other studies have shown that longer five prime UTRs tend to lead to decreased translational efficiency through post-transcriptional regulation. So this was the first thing we wanted to look at. Does this new 5' prime UTR affect the translational efficiency? So to do this, we just did this simple assay, which is to take a GFP reporter, clone in the annotated 5' prime UTR or our new um, unannotated 5' prime UTR or a control, and just monitor GFP production. And so we did this in 293 cells, transfecting in our UTRs, our GFP or a control M cherry plasmid. And we were really interested to see that indeed this new unannotated 5' prime UTR does result in a decreased translational efficiency for GFP. So we're producing less than half the amount um, compared to the annotated UTR. And this is just our M cherry as a control. And then we took into looking like in what is different between these five prime UTRs? Is there a motif that might hint at regulation for this five prime UTR? So just taking a look at this um, database reg 2.0, we looked at the um, motifs within these UTRs. And so comparing the annotated to the unannotated, they share some of these Mashabi elements. But one thing that was distinct in our unannotated UTR was this IRE element, which stands for an iron response element. So we wanted to know, is the iron response element something interesting in terms of regulating this protein? So what exactly do IREs do? Well, um, in cells, uh, you can have an IRE element here, which will interact with an iron response protein. And when this protein is bound, what we see is a decrease in translation, so a block in translation. However, if you have a situation where there's high iron levels in the cell, the iron response proteins are going to be sequestered by that iron, and so they'll move away from the IRE element. So now releasing that block, which will allow for protein translation to continue. So we know that um, it, there's lots of studies on these iron regulatory elements. And so what's really interesting is that normally if they're positioned within the five prime UTR of genes, they lead to translational inhibition. While you can also have an IRE element down in the three prime end, and this can actually lead to mRNA stabilization. So we wanted to ask if this IRE element within the five prime UTR of AIM2 is contributing to translational um, effects. And so to do this, we again took our plasmids and we performed site-directed mutagenesis to remove the IRE element and ask, does that uh, reverse the, the effects that we see from the UTR? And so again, same experiment, just into 293s, our UTR containing the IRE or the one without, and we monitor GFP expression levels. And so similar to what I've shown you before is that the unannotated is um, uh, producing much less GFP compared to our annotated version. And indeed, if we remove the IRE element, you can reverse this phenotype. So this is suggesting that indeed that IRE element is uh, contributing to the phenotype that we're observing. Another way that we could go about this was to ask if we overload the cells with iron and that iron will sequester away the iron regulatory proteins and release the effect on, um, on the gene, would we also be able to re reverse that phenotype? And so we did the same thing again. And this time we're overloading cells with iron uh, using ferric ammonium citrate. And again, we can see that indeed we can reverse that phenotype. So here we have our unannotated 5' prime UTR that's translating um, much less efficiently than the annotated. And if you overload the cells with iron, you're reversing this. So this is really suggesting that this 5' prime UTR element can be regulated through this iron response element. So all that I've shown you so far was in 293s, which is great, but we wanted to ask endogenously what is happening to AIM2. And so to do this, we did a, performed a Western blot. And so here is our antibody for AIM2. It's not the cleanest antibody, but we do have AIM2 knockout mice. So we can use them as a really nice control. So you can see this is a non-specific band, and this is the specific band for AIM2 that's obviously not in our knockouts. 
And so when we look at BMDMs and we look at the turnover of AIM2 normally in wild type cells, what you can see is that um, following 24, 48 hours, you're seeing this rapid decrease in AIM2 expression levels that then start to return again after um, 72 hours. And so we ask if we overload these cells with iron, what impact will that have on the endogenous levels of AIM2? And indeed, what we see is that you're no longer seeing this decrease um, at the 48 hour time point. And um, we did this obviously over a number of experiments. And so we can see that at this point, um, we can see a significant difference in the levels of AIM2. And so what we really believe is happening here is that during a normal inflammatory response, right, you need AIM2 there to help turn on genes and get, um, get the pathway started. But that, as I said, this at the beginning, these pathways have to be really tightly controlled. And if not, you can have chronic inflammation. And so we believe that in cells, what's normally happening is that you um, have AIM2 to allow the pathway to kick off. And then you want to rapidly shut down the expression of AIM2 to kind of reset the pathway and return cells to homeostasis. And um, that this is why you're dominantly moving to that upstream isoform after inflammatory activation as a way of turning over AIM2 um, and resetting the inflammatory response. And so in conclusion, what we see in macrophages that are just at baseline levels, that we are using this annotated AIM2 um, uh, promoter and start site, and this is leading to your canonical levels of AIM2 that we always see in cells. During an inflammatory state, we're now um, preferring to turn on this upstream isoform, and this is allowing for a turnover of the protein, so it's not going to be translated as efficiently, and this will allow for that stop in the pathway. And what's really interesting and something we're looking into more now is that in an inflammatory or um, a chronic inflammatory state, where can often be accompanied with changes in um, the metabolism in terms of iron. In this case, then you would dominantly keep on this isoform of AIM2, which would lead to this continual expression of AIM2. And we do know from other studies that there's hints of this in auto-inflammatory diseases, such as in lupus, there's connections between AIM2 and lupus, as well as iron dysregulation in lupus. And so that's something that we're interested in following up on is, does this help answer some of the phenotypes that are observed in uh, such uh, auto-inflammatory conditions? And so with that, I would like to thank my lab. Um, again, Electra did a lot of this work in collaboration with the Brooks Lab, uh, with Pratiba and um, Matthew, and I'd like to thank all our uh, other collaborators, Akinson Lab and Vulmer's Lab, that we do a lot of our nanopore sequencing with, uh, the Clunan Lab, who we get a lot of help in the iron side with, as well as the Wakeland Lab. And obviously thank all our funding sources. Thank you for listening, and I will be happy to take questions.